chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, verses 26 through 29. We have had a full day in church already, just a rich day. Again, just can't mess it up. Just can't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 26, the word of God says, When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come, let us pray. Father, thank you for trusting us in this space with your Holy Spirit. We've already been moved by your presence. And Father, in this uh, final act of worship, as we listen to your word as you ascribe worth to us and we ascribe worth to you, Father, we want to walk away with a changed heart, a new attitude, and a clear direction. So bid us to come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. So last week we talked a bit about the, the dichotomy in our culture where we're encouraged to be leaders Yet in scripture, we're called to be followers. I mentioned that at graduations, no one ever says, now go be the followers of tomorrow. They say, no, be the leaders of tomorrow. Yet scripture is very clear that we are called to be followers. Now some, yes, absolutely leaders, but I think many of us, even those who are on our way to becoming leaders, miss this very key space in our development of learning how to be a follower. As I said last week, every, every great leader must first be a good follower. And so in this story, I want to unpack what some of these lessons that I think contribute to us being better followers. So we're back in Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. And you have to understand what the situation is here. In Matthew chapter 14, going back to the very beginning of the the text, this is right after verse 22. This is right after Jesus had fed the 5,000 families. Not just 5,000 men, but 5,000 men, not including women and children. So this is 5,000 households that Jesus fed. So more more than likely 15 to 20,000 people in, in this space. But the people wanted to crown Jesus king. After this miracle of feeding 5,000 families with just a few fish, I believe they were veggie fish. That's just me, Morning Star. That's just me. Isa Jesus reading into the text. Vegetarianism, you know. So the Bible tells us that after, after they wanted to crown him king in, in the Gospel of John's account, that Jesus then disperses the crowd, tells them to go home And in verse 22 in Matthew, it says that immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, you have to understand how incredibly disappointing this was for the disciples. Because after this miracle, they were like, uh, (laughs) we about to make our march on Jerusalem right now. We're about to get this done right now. If Jesus can multiply fish and bread, that means at any moment he can multiply an army. He can take that group, take the best fighters in that group and multiply them and overwhelm Rome with sheer numbers. (laughs) It's about to be on. Let's crown him king right now. We've seen enough evidence that he truly is the Messiah. But Jesus throne would not be an earthly throne. Jesus' mission of expanding the kingdom of God wasn't wasn't relegated to just expanding the kingdom of Israel, at least not in the national sense. And so Jesus tells them to, to, to get into the boat and that he would meet them on the other side and he disperses the crowd. So everybody's a bit frustrated. 
Can I be honest with you? Sometimes Jesus just frustrates me. I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes he just frustrates me, but I'm not the only one who has been frustrated by the God Almighty. There are many people all throughout Scripture that were frustrated with our Creator. Frustrated. Especially when it feels like his plans don't make a lot of sense. We'll talk a little bit more about this in in a few weeks. And so they're frustrated and they walk away disappointed. They're getting into the boat. I can just imagine the disciples kicking seashells on their way to the boat can't believe Jesus. He's just too humble. We should probably take him by force. No, he told us to get in the boat and he'd meet us on the other side. Well, how's he going to get to the other side if we take the boat? That doesn't make any sense. Just do what the master says. Isn't that what Peter said last week? Lord, this does not make a lot of sense to go out fishing when we've done it all night and we haven't caught anything, but because you said so, right? Because you said so. So this is where they find themselves. They're listening to Christ even in their disappointment and even when it doesn't make a lot of sense. But may I tell you that if Jesus tells you to do so, do it. If he's truly your teacher, truly your rabbi, if he is the one that you're following, you listen to his words even when they don't line up with your logic. So the disciples are obedient and they get into the boat and they, and they push off from shore. I'm going to tell you something right now. Discipleship always involves disappointment. Always. There is no way to get around it. Discipleship, Michelle, will always, always involve disappointment. There's no way to get around it. It will always. And this is where we have to realize it's a part of the curriculum. And if you've gone to school, know when you're looking at the syllabus, you have all these assignments and you know what the teacher expects. Well, in Jesus' syllabus, it's like straight up disappointment. You're going to write essays on it. You're going to do report on it. You're going to have pop quizzes on disappointment. In fact, again, just go through the Old Testament and you will find a follower of God always at a crossroads. You know, in, in, in our Koinonia Bible study that is led out by our head elder, Doug, we're going through the book of, of Job, and you know exactly how it is, Doug, right? Job is disappointed. We read chapters where Job said stuff, if we said it in this sanctuary today, we would be censured. We would have to question the membership of a member if they said the things that Job said about God. Disappointment is simply part of discipleship. But there's a reason why it's a part of discipleship because in discipline and learning someone's discipline, you're sometimes going to be in uncomfortable situations. You're going to have to go against your own grain, go against your own instincts and and your own emotions and your feelings. And, And this is really the framework of this particular story. So Jesus sends them away. They're disappointed. And the Bible says that after he had dismissed them in verse 23, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Now, before I go on any further, I need to let you know why Jesus sent them away and why he went up to the mountainside alone. Now, the Bible tells us he did this a number of times where he would get up early in the morning and, and just go off on his own so that he could pray to his father. But this particular situation was special because Jesus had just heard that his first cousin, John the Baptist, the one who was the, 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 uh, his hype man, the one who came before Christ and prepared the way, he had just found out that John had been killed. In fact, this is why Jesus went to this place in particular. The Bible says that after hearing of John's passing, he went to a lonely place to get away from people. And even going to a lonely place to get away from people with no social media at this time, no Twitter, no, no, no Instagram, and no Facebook, you know, nothing like that, no Snapchat, nothing like that at all. Even trying to get away from people, 5,000 families show up. And Christ then had compassion on them, and that is why he preached, and he healed, and he even fed them. A one-stop shop, amen? You can get everything from Jesus. But Christ was also disappointed. Next to his passion experience, this might have been the most stressful 24 hours in Jesus' ministry, if you just look at all that happened in this time frame. 
But Jesus needed to get away because he needed to grieve the loss of his cousin. And this is the part we often miss in Jesus' ministry. We fail to see his humanity. We always want to see him as the teacher and the rabbi, but you have to understand that he was also a follower, not just being instructed by his father and his mother growing up, but also, and more importantly, in his ministry, being led by his father, following his father's directions. And I can only imagine some of the things that Jesus had to say to his father on that mountain as he prayed. Now, we don't have record of it because it was a private conversation, but could I just use a little bit of sanctified imagination and just imagine that the phone conversation between the father and the son might have gone something like this. Really, Dad? Really? But why why John? He's better than all the 12 that I have following me right now. I could have depended on him. I mean, won't I have somebody in my life? My my father has passed away. And John got me. He understood me. He understood what my mission was about. I can imagine a conversation going like this. But son, he had to decrease so that you could increase. I know, but that's like Batman and Robin. He could have just been a little bit less. But to be completely gone? You don't think Jesus ever had questions like this? We have record of the the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, who was a part of the plan of salvation, and and there in that moment with a lot of pain and suffering and, 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 and anxiety, he says, is there another way? Christ was God, he was also human. And in these moments, followers can struggle when they're being led and they cannot see beyond the portals of the tomb, as one author says. There are times that it even, it's a struggle for Jesus in faith to see past the darkness. Trust me, he experiences in Gethsemane, and I believe he experiences all throughout his ministry as well. We just, don't, we, we just don't have the information. We just don't have record of it. But trust me, Christ got away from people for a reason. Dad, today was tough. They tried to throw me over a cliff. And all I did was read scripture. Are you telling me this is how difficult it's going to be? I just read scripture and said today everything is fulfilled. That should have been a celebration moment. They tried to kill me. Am I going to be dodging rocks for the rest of my ministry? Yes. I know for most of us we think because Christ is the son of God and because he has this knowledge uh, uh, and insight with the Holy Spirit and with his father that, that his humanity would not struggle in these moments. But family, in order to follow Jesus, we must understand that he is our example as a human being. Not just as God, but as a human being. And this is why it's important when we have these moments of disappointment, when we can't see past the portals of the tomb, when we can't see through the storm, that like Christ, we spend time in prayer. Prayer is what anchors us. Prayer is what gets us to a place where we realize that God is, is, that has the bird's eye view and he can see things that we cannot see. Remember when John the Baptist got frustrated in the dungeon and and sent the text message to Jesus? Are you the one or should we look for another? (laughs) That was John the Baptist, the greatest man ever born of a woman, according to Jesus. And his faith, he's struggling. Why? Because he's human. No matter how many spiritual gifts that you have, if you, are, if you have stepped foot on planet earth and you have gone through the unfairness that life tends to bring our way, you will question. You will be Job in question. You will be Abraham in question. You'll be like Moses in question. You'll be like Esther in question and Ruth in question and like Mary in question. We question, and Jesus is there in this moment with his father. He's getting encouragement. He's getting direction. And the Bible tells us, going back to verse 24, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. I have to be honest with you. The situation is just getting worse for the disciples. Not only can they not crown Jesus as king and and speed up this, this, this new kingdom mission, but now they're in the middle of a storm. 
The storm is so great that they're actually fearful for their lives. And these are some trained fishermen in this boat. Now they're dealing with more disappointment. Who told us to get in the boat and meet him on the other side? And did he abandon us? There is nothing worse than following the directions of God, following the directions of Jesus, and you find yourself in a worse situation than you were before. Lord, did you tell me to marry this person? Lord, did you say that I should take this job? Wasn't this the school I was supposed to go to? And now I'm dealing with all kinds of financial issues. None of the financial aid has come through. Who told me to get in this boat? Oh, none of y'all like me. I question. <laughs> I question. And I question because I, I, read, I read books like the book of Job. And I saw how, he, how bold he was. And Jesus didn't strike him down with lightning, so I get bold. Some of my prayer conversations with God are wrestling matches, like Jacob wrestling with God. Now the disciples are in a, in a worse situation. Verse 25 says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. I like this because it doesn't say that he, when he saw them struggle, he decided then to end his prayer and go check on his disciples. It says, when dawn was about to break. This, Christ, in other words, he spent the entire night. His disciples were struggling all night in the middle of the lake. And Jesus is like, my prayer time ain't over. You know, sometimes we allow people's issues to become our issues to the point where we forsake time spent with God because we want to be everybody's savior. We want to handle all their problems. There is a time to help people in need, and there is a time when you recognize your own need to spend time with your Savior. Listen, this is probably one of my worst character flaws. I can be so self-sufficient. I can be so self-reliant. God, you've already given me your word. It's just wisdom. It's right here. I just got to do what you asked me to do. And sometimes God is like, yeah, uh, come rest a while, uh, chill, uh, pause. Listen to the still small voice. I may have a word for you that's not actually written in the Bible, but it's specifically customized for you right now. Spend time with me, Jonathan. I, I will, but I need to make a couple of phone calls and then, and then I still need to really prepare for the message, you know, coming. It's for you, Lord. It's your work. I've given my life to you. And he's like, pause, wait, stay on the mountain with me. But, but, but there's people struggling. They'll be okay. Jesus waits until his prayer time is over, and then he makes his way on to the lake. Now, of course, there's no rent-a-boat shops open. They haven't invented a helicopter at this point, children. And Jesus does not know how to surf. <laughs> there's only one way for Jesus to get to his disciples. He does, <laughs> you know, Jesus, Jesus sometimes pulls the God card. You know that, right? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's human, but he sometimes pulls that God card. He walks on water. This is, this is such an amazing moment. My mother had a painting of Jesus walking on water. It, it just, it was so beautiful. The, the, the artist did a wonderful rendering and it was peaceful and, and there, was, there, was, there was a moon and, and it was shimmering on the lake as Jesus was just kind of flowing and his hair flows. You know, most of those paintings and pictures, the pictures of this moment, it, Jesus' hair is just, you know, it's been shampooed. It's, you know, it has Pantene body and it's just, it's just flowing in the wind. It looks so graceful. Jesus walking on water. If you see it in films also, right, it's just wonderful special effects. But can I say something? Uh, Jesus was walking through a storm. I don't care what, what he did to his hair in the morning, it was frizzy at this moment. <laughs> just the moisture alone. Come on, ladies, you know how that goes. Just the moisture alone. I mean, this is, this is a storm. There is wind. There is thunder. There is lightning. So the same wind that is, is crashing waves on top of the disciples are also crashing on Jesus. And this is when you have to understand something about Jesus. He's built different because Christ could have easily disappeared and reappeared. He could have said, beam me up, Scotty, and then just appeared on the other side of the lake waiting for his disciples. Or he could have just transported himself to the boat. But Jesus is going to do it the hard way. Why? Because he never chooses the path of least resistance. 
Jesus always chooses the most difficult path. Why? Because that path brings him closer to you. It helps him uh, align his emotions and feelings with yours. It helps him to be more empathetic with what we struggle with. I love that Christ chooses the most difficult path because it's the path he can identify with the most suffering people on this planet. He can identify with their hunger. He can identify with their rejection. He can identify with their racism. He can identify with the abandonment. Christ always chooses the path of most resistance. No, I got this, Dad. I'm going to walk this one. I'm going to walk this. Perfect night for a little stroll, right? Jesus makes his way to his disciples. And it's an interesting thing that the Gospel of Mark records. In Mark 6, 48, just a real quick aside here. In Mark 6, verse 48, it says, He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. Question, why was Jesus walking on the water? Anybody? Why do you think he was walking on the water? What do you think? There's, there's, there's no bad answers. There's wrong answers, but no bad answers. <laughs> this is such an interesting text. Mark says he was about to pass them by. Like he was strolling on the lake, fighting through the storm, and going to pass them by. Why would Jesus do that? Didn't they need help? Are you ready for my wild guess, Jesus knew they would be fine. Jesus knew they would be fine. They would have to struggle, but they were going to make it. Sometimes we want God to rescue us from every little needle prick. Oh, Lord, why would you allow this to happen? You'll be fine. Your 401k lost $20,000. I'm sorry. You're going to make it through because you have 500K in there. You'll be fine. Some of us want God to rescue us from every moment. I just don't feel like he, he, he emotionally listens to me. Boy, I'm telling you, this generation, I mean, we're offended by everything. Anybody who has an independent thought of our, from, uh, uh, that differs from ours, we, we, we lose it. I'm not saying that some of the intricacies of relationships aren't important, that I think it is good for you to be emotionally available and to be able, your partner to be able to know that you're a good listener. But sometimes when people come back home from a difficult day, they don't want to listen to anybody. Sometimes we got to give people space to be who they are. I know there are some people out there, you would have issue with Jesus if he lived with you. Oh, you just think you can walk on water, don't you? <laughs> we have to be offended at everything. We, some of us are addicted to anger. We want to be angry with people. It gives us power and makes us feel more righteous in some ways. But I want to tell you something right now. You're going to get through it. I'll never forget going through one of the more darker, the more dark times in my life. I, I would probably say the darkest time in my life. And I remember someone coming alongside of me and says, you know what? You're not the first to go through this. You will not be the last. There are many people who have gone before you and they have survived. And I was like, that is true. Because sometimes when we're going through our dark situations. We think it's not survivable. There's no way I'm getting through this. I'm a goner. Lord, I just want to, I want to leave this place. I want to, I, I wish I was never born. Again, Job, I wish I was never born. May darkness, may darkness cover the day when it was said, a boy is here. They'll get through it. So Jesus was walking across the water. Can I give you the reason why I think he was walking across the water? It, listen, it's not why did the chicken cross. Well, actually, it may be. Hold on. I think he just wanted to get to the other side. I think Jesus just wanted to get to the other side. And he didn't have a boat. And it, 
And so this was, the, this was the way to get to the other side. He was going to meet the disciples on the other side because Jesus told them he would meet them on the other side. Jesus was being a person of his word, but as he's walking, they see him and they become more terrified and they begin to scream, it's a ghost. So Jesus, I think maybe a little bit of embarrassment was like, guys, guys, shh, really? It's me. Now you have to understand at, at at this time, according to the culture and what they believed, the ocean, the, the sea was where wickedness resided. It was, it was the abode of evil and darkness. They believed that the dead were buried in the sea. This was, this was the devil's domain. This is why in the book of Revelation it says there will be no more sea. It, 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 it symbolized evil for them. So when they saw Christ on the water, they believed it was an evil spirit who had come up from the, from the sea. And that's why they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus says, no, it's not a ghost. But then, can I just say something? I, I, I love this because sometimes we have fears that are not founded. We have some fears that people have instilled in us because they're generational fears. Our parents had these fears. They share them with us as children. Then we grow up afraid of the same things, Right? Some of this stuff is like written in our DNA. Because, you know, children aren't born racist. You know that, right? They're, they're not, right? All this stuff that we see in our world, we learn this stuff. And we've often learned it from parents and, 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 and our culture. And so I love the fact that Jesus is not afraid of the sea because it don't matter if it was the devil's house. Jesus is going to walk all around it, through it, on top of it, because he is not afraid of whatever the devil brings. Somebody say Amen. There is nothing the devil has in his arsenal or his empire that Christ is afraid of. And I love the fact that he can walk on the water and walk on what is believed to be the devil's domain because Jesus does not subscribe to our fears. He does not. He actually comes to dispel them. And this is why it says in 1 John 4, 18, that, that perfect love cast out all fear. John says if you continue to have fear, it means that you have not been made perfect in love. Christ came so that Fear would no longer have a hold in our lives. People make decisions, life-altering decisions, because they're afraid. I'm afraid it's not going to get better. Pastor, it's not going to get better. He hasn't listened to me for, for 10 years. It's not going to get any better. I'm just going to leave. Some of you not knowing that you left one month too early because there was about to be a breakthrough, but you didn't trust we cannot let our fears dictate our actions, dictate our direction. We need to be guided by something that is more dependable, that is clearer, less emotional. And so the disciples are losing their marbles. They're screaming, crying. Christ is like, no, it's me. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. I'm not going to pass you by. I'm stopping. What's up? <gasps> it's a ghost. It's a and Peter stands up and says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. Now, I, I used to think that Peter was crazy. Because that's the last thing that I would ever suggest. Let me come out onto the water with you in a storm. <laughs> like I just wouldn't go that route. But I think that Peter actually may be a little bit smarter than the rest of the disciples. Because in that boat, they were all screaming, afraid. Water was getting in the boat. Most likely the boat had been compromised. And Peter assessed that this was probably a more dangerous situation. And Christ seemed to be cool, just chilling on the water, right? So where do you want to be? 11 screaming disciples behind you or Jesus? A boat that is compromised, possibly sinking with 11 screaming grown men. No disrespect, men. Or Jesus? Many of us might react in an emotional way in that moment and say, I want to go to the safest place, who, who I see in this moment as being the safest. And so Peter makes a decision to go to, 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 go to Jesus. But I, I want to let you know something here. We should not make decisions to follow Jesus based on our emotional reactions. I don't care how good the music is, how good the sermon is. That's not why you should make a decision to follow Jesus. Many of us are emotional Christians. We, we, we emotionally follow God. In other words, when it feels good, I will follow. When it doesn't, I will abandon my post. 
When it feels good, I'll be in the pew. I'll contribute. I I can be counted on. When it doesn't feel good, I'm going to stay home. And so this is, where, this is where we find ourselves. Peter climbs up the side of the boat because Jesus says, come, come. Yes, in your disappointment, in your fears, in your maybe not knowing what's going on. All right, Peter, let's do this. Come. I can imagine the disciples trying to pull him back into the boat. Peter like, get off me, get off me. Judas, don't you touch me. And Peter climbs over the edge of the boat. I mean, I don't think it's a very stable surface, right? Gets his other leg over. Children, you can only imagine what this is like. You remember how it was when you were learning kids how to walk? I remember my son first learned how to walk. I used my cell phone. Come on, you can get it. And Nathan was like this. So I imagine Peter on the water trying to make his way towards Jesus. And Jesus is probably like, look at this man. I thought he was going to sink like a rock. Okay, come on, Pete. Let's go. Come on. Come on. The disciples are so excited. Look at Pete. He's doing it. He's doing it. Like old folk when they have their big old iPads. They don't use their phone. They use their iPad when they're taking pictures. (laughs) Going to capture this video. I love y'all. You can't do this. You can't do this. Needs to be your phone, you know. But this is it. Uh, I, I got him in frame. I got him in frame. There he goes. I can't wait to upload this when we get a signal. Oh, there you go. Go on, Pete. And Pete is making his way towards Jesus. And this is such an exciting moment when we finally decide to follow Christ and we get baptized and people have parties and we've successfully, you know, uh, navigated through the Bible studies. We're feeling really good. People are patting us on our back. Our hair is still wet from the baptismal pool. This is the best time to follow Jesus. Oh, the music is great. All of it is great. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. This is wonderful. And then a wave slapped Peter upside the head. He's walking, making his way towards Jesus, and this big wave crashes on him. All right. All right, I'm good. Just lost my balance. Just lost my balance. And the wind was strong and started to push back at Peter. Wait a second. Wait a second. Hold on. The thunder was loud. It was hard to hear Jesus. The lightning was blinding. Hard to see Jesus. It's all good when we're following Jesus as long as we're not getting wet. As long as there's no more wind. As long as there's no more storms. But family, when Christ calls us to follow him, he doesn't call us to follow him and there's going to be an absence of storms. He never says that. He never said that. In fact, just look at scripture. All the followers of God, all the followers of Christ are constantly bombarded with storms. But Peter could no longer see Jesus, could no longer hear him. And, 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 and he begins to panic. And the Bible tells us that Peter sinks. It's so interesting. I would have thought he would have started swimming, right? He's a fisherman. <laughs> they know how to swim. <laughs> I mean, their workplace is water, right? Peter loses. He's so afraid he can't even do the obvious. He just sinks. He doesn't swim. He just sinks. Losing our faith in these moments can have us sometimes going back to this infantile stage where we don't even know how to put one foot in front of the other. We make some of the worst decisions in our life. We feel abandoned by God. He didn't, he didn't care enough. He's going to allow the wind to mess up my hair like that. That's messed up, God. I thought you had my back. I thought you were going to be with me always. This is a lie. It's all a lie. Can't tell you how many people give up their faith because someone broke their heart. Get over it. It happens. It may not be the last time. Well, I lost my job, pastor. I know. You're not the first one to lose your job. Keep walking. Jesus says, come. But but I can't see you right now. Come. You see, sometimes when we lose sight of Jesus, we start looking all around where he is. He hasn't moved. He's right where you last saw him. So until Christ tells you to go in a different direction, you keep moving in the right direction. 
well, this, this, this relationship can't be for me. But it was for you five years ago when you committed to this person and, and we were here and we celebrated with you and, and you prayed and, and you said this was an everlasting covenant. Then you had clear direction, but now go up against a couple of waves. Now deal with a few storms back to back and now you don't know which direction. Jesus is right where you left him. Keep moving. Come. Jesus had to have the same type of faith at Calvary. He could not feel the Father, could not see the Father, but he had to in faith simply say this, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I don't see him, I don't feel him, but I know they are there. Come, keep walking. The Bible says that Peter sinks, and I love this part. The Bi- Peter sinks and he's able to get out one prayer. <laughs> it's a quick prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. He begins to sink, and the Bible says in verse 30 that he cries out, Lord, save me. Can I encourage you? I know this is going to sound a little bit churchy for you, but, but for, for those of you out there, when you are sinking, when you are sinking, don't, don't try to kill the pain with pain killers. When you are sinking, don't try to, to, to divert your attention, you know, frivolous entertainment. When you are sinking, can I just challenge you? Cry out, Lord, save me. Some of our depression, some of our emotional trauma, some of the, the, the PTSD that we've experienced won't be solved in therapy. I, I, I'm, I'm all for therapy. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for even the self-help books. I mean, we can learn from a lot of different places, but some of our stuff is spiritual in nature. And it takes a deep anchoring in our faith where we need to cry out and simply say, Jesus, save me. Too many times we're looking outside of the source of our redemption, the source of our salvation. And Peter in that moment doesn't say, "Uh, bring the boat closer. He doesn't even ask the disciple, give me an oar. Save me, Jesus. Save me. The Bible says that Jesus reaches out. He clasps Peter's arm and pulls him up. He then walks Peter back to the boat. When they get into the boat, I can imagine Peter just coughing up water. I didn't see you anymore, Jesus. I didn't see you anymore. I was there, Peter, but I didn't see you. I saw you. But I I didn't hear you anymore. I couldn't hear you. I know, but I heard you. I was there. Why did you lose faith? Family, can I ask you a question? Why did you lose faith? May I make a suggestion? The worst time to lose faith is when you're in a storm. Trust him even more. Don't trust him when you get out of the storm. Trust him in the storm. That's when you need it the most. Trust him. Listen, being a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, means we're going to face storms. We're going to face storms. We're not going to avoid them. We're going to face them. We're going to go through them. Following Christ all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament are a bunch of people that went through storms. It was a part of their curriculum, disappointment, uh, uh, trials. It, it was, it was a being in the darkness. It was a part of it. The depression, all of it was a part of it. The anxiety, it was all a part of it. But this is the difference between someone who follows Christ and someone who doesn't follow Christ. A follower of Christ, though they go through storms, they stay on top of the water they don't sink it'll hurt it'll be difficult but you're going to get through it it'll hurt it'll be difficult but you're going to get through it the Bible tells us that when Jesus gets into the boat The storm stops. Oh, that's a good word. Boy, that's a whole sermon in itself. One day Jesus is coming back, right? He's soon and very soon. Don't make me sing that song. We had church today. Soon and very soon. One day Christ is going to come back and he's going to step into the boat again. And all of our storms are going to stop. 
John has an, an additional point in this story, I want to say. Not only does Jesus step in the boat and the storm stops, but in the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, it says that, that, that they arrived at the shore. <laughs> not only did Jesus step into the boat, not only did he step into the boat and the storm stopped, but they reached their destination. Oh, that's a good word. One day Christ, who knows what it's like to go through storms, Christ, who knows what it's like to go through unfairness, Christ, that also had his emotional days, Christ, who sometimes couldn't see past the darkness, even Christ, who knows what it's like to be human through and through and has the nail scars to prove it. I get it. I understand. He's coming back and he's going to step his foot. He's been here before. Oh yeah, it's familiar. And there will be no more storms. We'll be at that shore soon and very soon. There will be no more sea soon and very soon. No more monsters, no more doubts, no more fear soon and very soon. But until then, walk on water. Come, Jesus says, follow me. It's difficult. Of course it's difficult, but it'll be more difficult if you sink. Come, follow me. But I'm afraid. I know you are. I am here to take care of those fears. Come, follow me. But I don't know if I'm going to get through it. You're going to get through it. I've seen the end of your story. Come. I wouldn't have asked you to be here if I didn't think you were going to get through it. Come. On these oceans. On these waters. Come. Follow me. It's dark, it's cold, but we're going to get through this together. I am right where you left me. I am still here. But I left you at 17 because you weren't there to protect me. I was there. I saw you and I heard you. Well, how could you see me and hear me and do nothing about it? I was. Look at my hands. I was. I was. Now come. Father God, you beckon us to come. On the waters, you've called us. There is a lot of disappointment that we've been dealing with. Our life hasn't ended up the way that we wanted so far. We don't know if we went the wrong direction, if we chose the right person. We don't know if it was the right job. We're, we're unsure about so much right now, but Father, you have called us and we just need to trust. If you tell us to get in the boat, we're gonna do it because you said it. If you tell us to, 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 to row, we're going to row. And if you tell us to come out of the boat onto the water with you, we're just gonna trust you wherever you are, wherever you go. We will follow, even when the relationship doesn't feel right. It's not good. It just, we don't feel good in it. We know that you're in it with us, and there's something miraculous that can happen. So we're going to trust you, even in our disappointment, even in our fear. May our faith overcome our fear. We're coming. We're following. Thank you, Jesus. Save us in your name.